so okay so what's the outline and what are the topics i want to cover so the, the first thing this is a school on correlated electron systems so the first thing i need to do is i need to explain what are correlated electron systems and you will see that this sort of definition is somewhat subtle uh, uh, because after all all the electrons are always interacting in any solid with via the coulomb interactions so why are some systems harder to treat than others so that's sort of the first thing that we need to understand so that we know what we're talking about so after we set up a common language and we sort of know what strongly correlated uh, electrons are i have to sort of define the notion of locality um, uh, because that's sort of very important for the things that we do and again we will see that it's not it's somewhat a subtle concept once we have defined these two things i can sort of set up our research goal how do we combine electronic structure and dynamic and field theory i'll give you an example of this combination via examples which is something which is called lda plus dmft which now is very widely used in the center we are sort of trying to go beyond this paradigm but this is sort of like nowadays the workhorse for treating from first principles correlated electrons and so sort of i would like to present the way that our school our, our school the lecturers in the school and our center is trying to go beyond this and then i would like to give you some examples of correlated electron behavior and i picked many probably i will only have time to cover one or two of these because there are many many ways in which correlations can manifest themselves it's an extremely rich field but even my goal is not to cover everything, but just to give you some example why you should be interested in correlated systems and provide some targets that you may want to study with the codes that are going to be disseminated in this school. So basically is the, that, that's sort of the outline. And now let's go to the beginning. Uh, we know in solid state physics what is the Hamiltonian. And the Hamiltonian is given by the kinetic energy of the electrons, the kinetic energy of the ions, the interaction between the electrons and the ions, the interaction between the electrons themselves, and the interaction among the ions. So unlike particle physics, we know what the Hamiltonian is. But of course, it's a great challenge to extract physical information from this Hamiltonian. Just by looking at the Hamiltonian, you cannot tell why lithium is different than silica. So that's one of the things that are important the ab in ab initio. We want to start from this. We want to start from the atomic positions and the atomic charges. But we, all, we also use something else to treat correlated electrons, and you have to keep these two views in mind. Sometimes one writes very simplified models. And what we have here is something which is called the Haber model as an example, where one now has electrons on a crystal. They're hopping on sides of a lattice with some hopping matrix elements. And they have some on-site interaction, U, just to give an example. And what we've done here is we eliminated all the many, many details we're only keeping some pieces of this, but we somehow trade this elimination of degrees of freedom by some effective parameters. And once we have the model, of course, it's very easy to know the correlation strength because if you turn off this term, which is annoying, then you have free electrons, which are uncorrelated. But if you make this thing very large, then this thing uh dominates the physics and it's very correlated so my goal first is to explain what correlations mean for a hamiltonian of this type not sort of for the Haber model 
Now, there's another notion that you should have, which is the notion of many body theory. So in principle, we know how to, um, how to deal in principle with any Hamiltonian where we have two terms. And now uh, I wanna use the blackboard for a moment and I will simply share my board. And, it, and it's to do perturbation theory. Perturbation theory means that we sort of draw some diagrams where we have here the Coulomb interaction. And then basically we try to compute the free energy by evaluating all possible graphs where we connect green lines, which are called Green's functions via those Coulomb interaction lines. And the Green's function is a central object of our approach is a function of two spatial variables, R and R prime, because we have a solid and the frequency. So that's a central object here, which is called the Green's function. And this is, can be measured in spectroscopic measurements, such as photoemission and inverse photoemission. And then basically um, one can sort of summarize the, the, the interactions in the functional in a beam is something which is called the beam cadence of functional phi, which is a function of two things, the Coulomb interactions and the Green's function, which is the summation of all possible types of graphs with this Coulomb interaction and the full Green's function. And basically that's a very important notion. In principle, if we sum all the graphs, we solve the many body problem. And this is neatly summarized. I will stop sharing the blackboard and I will share now my screen. And this is neatly summarized in what's called the Bain Cardano functional, which is written here. Phi of G is what I explained to you before, is the sum of all diagrams. And then we have some extra pieces here. We have G minus one, which is the full Green's function. G zero minus one is the Green's function that has just the Laplacian and the external potential. And the nice thing about this functional is that if we extremize it with respect to G, then we get something which is called the Dyson equation, which is the full uh, which contains a, a set of equations for solving the many body problem in the solid, provided that you can add all the diagrams. So I'll sort of summarize that. And I'm sort of not giving you a derivation of this result, but just telling you that delta phi delta G is called the self energy which is the sum of all diagrams of this type up to infinite order. And then if you differentiate the Bain Cardano functional, it's a very simple exercise that it gives you an equation that G zero minus one minus delta phi delta G is equal to G minus one. And G zero minus one is the only place that we have the external potential in the solid. So phi of G is universal. It doesn't depend on which solid we are treating. The only place where the information about the atoms is in here. So in principle, if we knew this universal Bain Cardano functional, if we would know this, we have a solution to the many body problem. In practice, one approach is to do the perturbative expansion. And now, uh, let me now go back and talk about, let me share my screen again. And now let me introduce one more notion that you need to know which is the notion of the screen Coulomb interactions. Now, the, the Coulomb interactions are long range, 
but the electrons in the solids screening. And if you sum these diagrams, which are called the RPA diagrams, then you get a form of the interaction, which is short range. This is called W, which is the screen Coulomb interactions. And one more notion that you need to know is this functional of the Coulomb, of the Green's function and the screen Coulomb interactions. If we extremize this functional is just like the beam cadano functional, but it has the property that is expressed in terms of W, the screen Coulomb interactions in terms of VC. So that's basically just a very quick introduction to at least the terminology of many body theory. And I'm hoping that all the lecturers will go into this in more detail. And now I wanna to switch topics to something else which is the density functional theory. So why study density functional theory? Well, as you know, the density functional theory in material science is probably the most successful theory that we have. It's because the many body theory, uh, this computation of all diagrams to infinite order is still too hard to do even for modern computers. And in this school, you're gonna see the heroic efforts to going to next order in the Coulomb interactions by Andrei Kutepov, but still this is just first and second order in the interactions. It's not, and that's really the state of the art. It has not been possible for the problem of realistic solids to sum up all the perturbation theory. So it turns out that there is an approach which is simpler and it's in some sense uh, much more economic, which instead of fo focusing on the Green's function, which has spectroscopic information, focuses on the density. So that's the key idea of the Con Sham Hornberg approach to the density functional theory, which just like the Bain Cadano functional says that there is a universal part of the functional that doesn't depend on material. And the material dependence enters only in a simple term via the crystal potential. And then we have some functional of the density where if we extremize this functional, we can compute the total energy of the solid. And thanks to this, people have been able to evaluate energies very, very, very precisely in many, many, many materials. And of course, this universal functional, the analytic form, again, it's not known exactly, but people have found very nice practical approximations to this functional, which enables the quantities to be computed. And again, probably I should use the board and give you a little bit more information about that. So let me share my screen. And go to the blackboard. Another page to the board. This functional of the density is made of several parts. First, we take the kinetic energy of non-interacting electrons with density rho. Then we get the Hartree energy of the electrons. So we have the kinetic energy, we have the Hartree energy, this is the universal part. And then the rest we call exchange correlation of rho. That's what we need to approximate. But this we take from the uniform electron gas. And in fact, how do we compute the kinetic energy? Well, to compute the kinetic energy, this is the kinetic energy of non-interacting electrons. With density rho. 
To compute that, we solve something which is called the Consham equations, which is a very important concept. Consham equations. And the Consham equations are just like a Schrodinger equation with some potential. So it's just a one particle Schrodinger equation that it's easy to solve in the computer. Let me add a page. But then of course, we have to make sure that the density is reproduced. So the potential has to be adjusted here so that this produces the density of the solid and that's just the Fermi function e to the beta ekj minus v. So that's what's called the Consham equations. It's very important. And then this has to be, this Hamiltonian is a very important Hamiltonian. It's called the Consham Hamiltonian. It can be written in any basis. So the Consham Hamiltonian, which is this, this Hamiltonian, when written in some basis, we will write this at HK Consham. The reason why there's K here is because we have crystal translation invariance in the solid. Okay, after this long introduction, I'm ready to define for you correlations because you know everything that you need to know to describe correlations now. So I will share my screen. So you learn two things. You learn about the density functional theory and you learn about many body theory. And you learned about the density functional theory and I told you that this thing is quite good. And you can extract from here the density. You can also extract the non-interacting Green's function that corresponds to the Consham Hamiltonian. And here it is, I'm highlighting this Green's function, which is called the Consham Green's function. So that's my G zero. So your first step is always to do an LDA calculation. The second step is to compute the Consham Green's function. And I'm hoping that Andre Kutepo will show you how you do that. And then that's your starting point for the perturbation theory. And the materials which are weakly correlated are the materials were doing first order perturbation theory in the screen Coulomb interactions. So we take the screen Coulomb interactions that I explained to you before, and you put a G zero here. And of course I added a, an extra potential. So I have to take it out. So in cases that this is a good approximation to the full Green's function, we say that the materials are weakly correlated. So for, as an operational definition, weakly correlated systems are those for which this G0, W0, which was first uh, implemented by Mark Hyberson in his PhD thesis more than 50 years ago, is a good approach. And the reason why this sort of survived the test of time is because it has predictive power. It's fully first principles. And this is a classic graph that uh, is shown many, many times where we take every possible semiconductor that we know. The letters are sort of a little bit small because I kind of go to screen mode, but believe me that we have here every semiconductor from lithium fluoride to silicon to germanium. And the LDA approximation really underestimates those gaps, sometimes produces negative gaps like in germanium. But once you do the first order correction in perturbation theory, then you get good gaps and you're happy with the results. And that's why the semiconductors are weakly correlated systems according to this definition. And there've been many systematic advances um, G0W0 is just a starting point. 
And what you're going to see uh, hopefully tomorrow, or actually or this afternoon, or if not at the latest tomorrow, Andre will show you how you can make the calculations of gaps more accurate by not just doing first order perturbation theory, which was this graph, but going to the next order. But that's sort of the weekly correlated materials. Our center is interested in treating all materials. We are inclusive, and we will also like to treat strongly correlated materials. Those are materials where this connection to the bands of density functional theory does not apply. And in this case, you cannot really follow the textbook and do just perturbation theory or band theory. And the reason for that is that these materials have a lot of atomic physics at low energies, and that's not captured correctly by the band theory. And they're interesting because they do many big things, colossal magneto resistance and conventional superconductivity, giant thermoelectric responses. There are many useful materials which are strongly correlated. And until very recently, there was very little quantitative theoretical guidance in this area. But with the methods that you learn in this school, which are the dynamic mean field theory plus electronic structure, we found some way of just going beyond perturbation theory by just going to all orders while retraining a local approximation. And that's sort of the, 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 the tool that we're going to use. And in the talk by Sang Choi, where he's going to show you how one can use dynamic mean field theory on top of electronic structure to make predictions for materials which are like semiconductors they're not connected by perturbation theory to the density functional theory. Now, just to sort of motivate you, we know how to make correlated materials. They appear throughout the transition metal series, the 3Ds, the 4Ds, the 4, or the F series, 4Fs or 5Fs. And basically, usually appears when you take the transition metals, which have open shells. That's why the perturbation theory doesn't work, because when you have open shells, you cannot describe the open shell of an atom just in terms of a band, which is describing a closed shell. And they do very useful things. It's just a nice example just to walk across one series, like the transition series, the, the, the 3D series. And you see vanadium oxide is a fantastic material because it has a room temperature metal insulator transition. You can use that to make smart windows. If you go to manganese, lanthanum strontium manganese O3 is known because of this giant colossal magneto resistance. You can tune the resistivity of the material with tiny changes of the magnetic fields. If you go to cobalt, you get uh, things like lithium cobalt oxide, which is the material which has been the workhorse of the battery industry for many years. Uh, John Goodenough earned the Nobel Prize for the discoveries and the developments of these things. And finally, the, if you go to copper in the D9, part of the series, you end up with high temperature superconductors, which are the copper oxides. And again, the issue is that on one side, if you, the spacer layers, what they do is they separate the transition metal ions. Once they are very far apart, they form atoms. Once they are very close, they form bands. And these two limits are not connected. That's really, the strong correlation problem. And that's sort of the first introductory, the, the end of the first part of the introduction. So let's wrap up what we've done. I asked and I gave you a, an answer to what are correlated systems. And in the process, we introduce things which will be needed for all the subsequent lectures. So now you know what the, the density functional is, 
what the GW method is, what correlations mean, what the Ben Cadano functional means, how you do perturbation theory in W, and that's sort of what I call the heading program, doing perturbation theory in W. And I should stop here to see if there are any questions in the chat or on the Slack. Are there any questions? Can I don't, you hear me? I, I, yeah, I can hear you, Gabby. I don't see any. Okay, so if there are no questions, that means that we can move on to the next topic. And the next topic is- Just a, just a minute. Uh, guys, uh, just feel free to, if you have any questions about Gabby's uh, presentation, please feel free to just write in chat and we'll get to you. Okay, um, so please speak up uh, whatever comments or questions you have. Thank you. I do see a question, Gabby. Um, yeah, so please read it, read the question because again, I'm in a kind of monitor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, three screens right. and the yeah. chat, but yeah. I can listen to the question. So somebody want uh, Mao Yang wants a, a, a textbook recommendation for learning Bame Kadanoff, but I think the functional formula. Right. Formula. Okay. So books, it's in any many body theory textbook, Bame and Kadanoff textbook, but it's in any many body textbook. And in fact, uh, let me go to the beginning of the lecture. Uh, and the, I, I should recommend a, a lecture. If you're interested in many body theory of solids, there is a series of lecture notes which are free. They are available to anywhere, to anyone. And here is the web address where you can download it. Those are schools that have taken place in the winter and have been organized by Eric Koch and Eva Pavarini. And while they're not hands-on schools, they have detailed lecture notes where all the topics of correlations are covered. But uh, the other thing that I would recommend, if you want a nice derivation of the, of the Bain Kadanoff uh, uh, approach. I have one in this reference that I put at the beginning. And just like when I'm teaching, I will clean up these slides and I'll share them with you, with all the lecture participants. But the classic textbook for Bain Kadanov was written by Bain and Kadanov. And it's, it's so it, it's a, and they describe that functional. Here you will find a very streamlined derivation in an appendix. Other questions? Yes, there's another. And, and by the way, my, my job is really to give you an overview. I mean, I, I can spend a lecture or half an hour deriving things, but what I wanted to do is just give you an overview so that at least the language that other lecturers will use uh, is available to you. Yes, other questions. So the, on slide, so it's a question regarding slide 11. Okay, what was slide 11? Uh, yeah, okay, here, slide 11, yes. The, the question is uh, the exchange potential VXC is subtracted in the perturbative addition. Does, this, yes. does that mean the exchange potential cancels and is not needed to be approximated at all? Okay, that's a very good question. And it's better to answer that type of question in the blackboard. So let me uh, answer that question in the blackboard. Why do we subtract the exchange correlation potential? Okay, so what I wrote is that G minus one is G zero minus one consham minus the G zero W zero graph minus the exchange correlation. And what is G zero? G zero minus one is I omega plus mu plus Laplacian minus the Consham potential, which was the Hartree potential, the crystal potential, and the exchange correlation potential. So that's G0 Consham. So you see, when we combine these things, imagine that this was the exact self energy. So when we combine these things, I have the exchange correlation here and the exchange correlation here. So they cancel. And then I have the, the Green's function is the exact Green's function. I have 
the Laplacian, which is the kinetic energy, the heart rate term, the crystal term, and I would have the full self energy. The, the reason why we include the constant potential here is because we feel this G is already close to the exact G. This is G minus one. But then when we start doing many body perturbation theory, we need to subtract it. So this is something, this, is, this was our best approximation. That was our best static approximation because it doesn't depend on the frequency to the self energy. But once we are putting the self energies, which are dynamic, we have to subtract what we put in. Is that clear? The self energy is never small. What is small is this. And we're doing perturbation theory. Is the answer clear? So the constant Green's function is like a free Green's function where I added the exchange correlation potential. The exchange correlation potential is something I add to try to approximate my full Green's function. But then if I'm gonna do something more exact, I put the more exact result, in this case, the G0, W0 self energy, but I need to subtract what I put at the beginning. Are there other questions? What is the exact Green's function of the solid? The exact Green's function, in, in other words, let, this, this would be a good Green's function. Be hard free. That's the crystal plus GW. Okay, this will be a good Green's function. But to get to the group good Green's function, that's the one that gives us the exact gaps. To get to that, we work in two steps. First, we subtract and then we add. And this thing here we call the consham Green's function. This is not good enough to get the gaps. This is good enough to get the gaps. And this correction is relatively small. All right, so let's continue. So, so Gabby, there is another question, another two okay. questions. Why are LDA functionals used instead of GGA functionals in combination? Well, you can use GGA. I mean, you can use any density functional. Uh, I, I presented the LDA because that's where things started. They're for, for computing the spectra, they're pretty much all the same. They're always static approximations, so they cannot really give good spectra. Uh, but uh, of course, there are improved functionals. I also wanted to stress that in the LDA, to get LDA, one takes the exchange correlation potential, which is a complicated functional, as the exchange correlation potential of the uniform electron gas at the density rho. And this idea of taking reference systems to approximate something, it's a very powerful idea. And it will appear in the dynamic and infield theory. So the reference system is the uniform electron gas. Is there any other question? Yes. Uh, there's a question of why full electron potentials are used rather than pseudo potentials. Well, we use full elect we we use full electron potentials in our center because our goal is to obtain very, very accurate results for many body systems. And the pseudo potentials have been extensively tested 
for density functional theory. If pseudopotential is something that you use to reproduce the density functional theory band structure. What we're interested in is in correlated materials and interested in spectroscopic properties and we're interested in Green's functions. And at this point, in my opinion, the, the, the pseudopotentials for those methods still need to be developed. Uh, there is an effort at Oak Ridge to develop pseudopotentials for the quantum Monte Carlo, but that's sort of at the beginning stages. So since we want to get accurate results and there are no pseudopotentials for many body theory, we use all electron codes, which are not any slower than the pseudopotential codes. So uh, there's nothing is lost by going to a good all electron code. Another question, Gabby? Yes. Did I understand the question read, did I understand correctly that weakly correlated materials are those that can be described by well, described well by G naught W naught? And, yeah. and if yes, is it because correlations are only captured by higher order diagrams? No, no, I mean, uh, uh, okay. yes. Uh, for me, the correlated materials is with G naught W naught is close to the V exchange correlation potential when we can do perturbation theory. The thing I like to stress is that G naught W naught works when it's close to the exchange correlation potential, when there is a sense to some perturbation theory. So from a physics point of view, the weakly correlated systems are those which are smoothly connected, adiabatically connected to the conscience system. And the G0 W0 is the first step in that connection. And you'll see tomorrow how you can improve it systematically. Now, nobody told you that this perturbation theory is converging for all materials. And there are many materials where that thing doesn't work at all. So that's how I divide my world into the weak correlation and the strong correlation. And all the materials are very interesting. Just, I think it's useful to, to divide them because you will see the strategy of the center depends a lot on that division. Should we move forward? Yes, that, that was the last question. Okay, very good. So I think this format works well. So with the board and, uh, and the slides. By the way, do you know how to get rid of presenter mode, uh, Robert? Get rid of presenter mode? Yes, because if I could get rid of presenter mode, I could actually uh, uh, share my screen. I think you would just have to pick on the PowerPoint, you just pick, go to slideshow and. Yeah. 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 yeah but I, then I want to end. All right. Yep. Then, then you get only the slide. Yeah. But it occupies my second screen. So I lose my blackboard. Oh, okay. Well, because I have all the notes and all the nonsense. Yeah. Sorry. No, I don't, I don't know how to finesse that. Okay. All right. So let's see what happens with this. Maybe I won't need the board any, again. So, okay. So, so, okay. So now I want to give you an idea. I, I want to switch topics and we're going to talk about what is locality and why do we care about locality? That's true. And, uh, and I want to introduce the concept of quantum embedding, which is a very important concept. And I will introduce it just with a model because I introduced the Hubbard model and I will just take a one band system. And the key idea of the method is that now, rather than thinking about bands, we view the solid as a collection of atoms. So think of here as a lattice of atoms. So at each side, I have an atom. And then ask yourself, what, what is happening in the atom? Well, the atom has many different many body states. If you have only S electrons, which is the cartoon, I have an empty state. I can have one S electron up, you can have one S electron down, or you can have two S electrons occupying the same state. Those are different many body configurations. And the atom is happily fluctuating if it's in a metallic state between all these configurations because it's forming a solid. So that's sort of the dynamical mean field view of the atom, of the, of the solid as a collection of the atoms. And what we do 
is by focusing on one atom, we can replace all the other atoms by a quantum medium, by a reservoir of electrons, which can supply electrons to make transitions between the different atomic states. And that's what's called the quantum embedding. And then, of course, this medium has to be determined in a self consistent way because all the atoms were equivalent because we have a solid. So that's basically the idea. Now, uh, in practice, to, and, and the idea is nothing strange, it's the same thing you learn in statistical mechanics when you do the Ising model. When you keep, do the Ising model, you know that if you want to describe the magnetism, you will just look at all the Ising spins, and you will just replace all of them except for a central site by a vice field, which is a magnetization. And then you get to find the mean field equations from the magnetization. Here, we do exactly the same thing. We just look at the Haber model, and we replace the Haber model by something which de describes the atom surrounded by a medium. So the atom is what we have here. We have the U, we have the chemical potential of the, of the Hubble model. All these are the local terms. And the medium we describe by some other quantum mechanical degrees of freedom, which I describe by a function, which is called the vice field. And now I want to write on the board, so I will stop share this. Uh, and now, Let's see, that's why I didn't want to go to the screen. And now I have to share my board. Can you see the board? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, yes. so basically what we did is we took a lattice of atoms and then we focused just on one and we replaced that by whatever I had, the Hamiltonian had a U, you put a U, uh, it had some local term, you put the local term, and then the rest, the kinetic energy, the TIJs that allow, enable you the hopping, you just replace by some hybridization functions to new degrees of freedom, which are your bath. That's sort of the Anderson impurity model. And those parameters are your mean field parameters. Now, what is the self-consistency condition? The self-consistency condition is very simple and has two important ideas. The lattice greens function for this very simple model that had only S electrons has, is very simple. It has omega minus epsilon K minus a self energy, okay? Because since we have only one band, everything is just a number. We don't have to deal with matrices. But the assumption that the MFT makes is that sigma of omega does not depend on K, which in real space means that the self energy is local. So that's the first time that we see locality. And this locality is what enables us to compute it from the impurity model and to determine it in a self-consistent way. Why? Because the lattice greens function now has this local impurity self-energy that I compute from the impurity. From the impurity, I can also compute the local greens function, which is a function of omega. So these things depend on the bath. And for a general guess of the bath, they are not going to be equal. So the bath is determined by requiring that the local Green's function obtained from here is the same as the local Green's function obtained from there. So that's called the DMFT self-consistency condition. And it's very intuitive. So we have an impurity which describes the atom. We use the impurity to get two things, the local Green's function and the local self-energy. In general, the self-energy embedded in the lattice will not be consistent with what you do in the impurity, but if we adjust the vice field, it will be 
and that's the DMFT cell consistency coefficient. So now you know everything about dynamic amine field theory. Conceptually, is not more difficult than the vice field mean field theory. What is the difficulty? Well, the difficulty is that the local problem is much more difficult because now you need to solve a problem which involves frequencies and therefore you need to solve a fairly complicated problem. But there's been a lot of progress and there is a lot of technology for doing that. And in this school, I can already introduce that you will get instructions in how to use a very powerful Monte Carlo method. Uh, the algorithm for this was invented by Philip Werner many, many years ago. It's a very well-developed technique. The thing that uh, was added to make this uh, suitable for electronic structure calculations and is described in this computer physics communication and Corey Melnick will describe in detail is the ability to put a frequency dependent Coulomb interaction inside in, rather than a static view in the impurity model. So that's one thing I wanted to say. And then the other thing I wanted to say is that the impurity solver is a foundation of the, the dynamic amine field theory. And in terms of reference, there's an excellent review by Emmanuel Dahl, which reviews uh, all the techniques, all the Monte Carlo techniques for doing that. There are also NRG techniques, which are reviewed in this article by Ralph Bula. So there's a lot of technology in here. And in the school, you will get specific instructions on how to use one of these things, which is very powerful, also has been ported to GPU, which uh, makes it very fast. But that's the central difference between dynamic amine field theory for a classical system and for a quantum system, that, 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 the, that the local problem that needs to be solved is more involved. Now, now we can go back to the locality. So we gain something marvelous that we can go to infinite order in perturbation theory. So now, at least for the Hubbard model, we can get results in the band limit and in the atomic limit, which is infinitely strongly correlated. When we... Now, it's important that this, the locality is assumed for sigma, not which is a self-energy. The Green's function is never local. And it's exact in, in a non-trivial limit when the coordination of the lattice is large. So it's very likely to be quite good already for FCC lattices in three dimensions. And it's also good in physical situations where the correlation lengths are short. For example, at large doping, at high temperatures, when there's strong fr frustration. Finally, single side DMFT, which is the extreme assumption that the self energy has essentially zero range, is just one version of this. And now there are, if you need to take into account short range correlations, you can apply exactly that reasoning with some modifications to clusters. That's what's called cluster extension or dynamic amine field theory, and then get systematic improvements. Um, so that's basically what I wanted to say about the MFT. And now I want to go back to the question that I asked about quantifying correlations and locality. So we already saw in the discussion that correlations take place when sigma minus the exchange correlation potential gets large. 
or when the G0, W0 no longer gives us a good starting point for the spectra. Uh, that's sort of correlation in general. And we can treat correlations with dynamic mean field theory, but that's only works when we have some locality. And when we have a real many body problem, not just the Hubbard model with S bands, this locality is defined with respect to a basis set. So what we so what we need to do is we need to introduce a basis for the solid. And the basis here can be any localized basis that you can think of. Uh, you can build Vanier functions or you can build uh, LMTOs. Uh, you can use uh, any localized basis and expand it in that basis. And once you do that, you can talk about the range of the self energy, whether this sigma is short range or long range, like we were discussing when you have the Haber model. And there are many cases now that, and of course, this notion of range can depend on the energy range because and that's why it's important to understand this concept, because at high frequencies, the self energy always goes back to a heart refock, which is very far away from LDA. So in some sense, at high frequencies, the correlation is strong. The reason why we managed to use LDA is because we ask low frequency properties, like an energy gap. So the and, and also this, I should also stress, this is the notion of correlations that we use in physics. The chemist means something else by correlations, which sometimes confuses the issues because in chemistry, the starting point is not LDA, the starting point is hard to fog. So for a chemist, correlations are differences with respect to hard to fog. But in this lecture, correlations will mean ref differences with respect to LDA. So what I want you to extract from this slide is that correlations are frequency dependent and they also need the introduction of a basis set, which is localized to define the notion of the range of locality and the self energy. And if I have time, I will show you some recent work uh, where we try to take some material and from experimental data, we try to show that the local approximation is actually quite accurate. But um, OK, so maybe there's one more thing. How am I doing with time? I use my first hour. So I would like to mention one more thing, why this notion of locality is tricky. because it's something important to understand and there's a lot of confusion in the literature. Once, so again, on the notion of locality, imagine now that I'm dealing with a multi-orbital model, okay? So now instead of having the one band Haber model, I have something where the Hamiltonian not only has sites, but has different orbitals. For example, imagine I want to treat D electrons, so I need to treat F electrons. So alpha and beta now run over a bunch of indices. So alpha are my orbitals. And alpha can be 14, for example, if I'm dealing with F electrons. And now, of course, the interactions are also a little bit more complex. And I still will take them to be local. Now, the notion of locality really has to be defined carefully because the Green's function, G of omega and K, if I want to write it in a basis 
which is close to the band basis, I can diagonalize this, I can work in the band basis. So I have here some eigenvalues. If I want to add a self-energy here, even in dynamic mean field theory, the self-energy will be k-dependent. So I introduce it by band basis by Fourier transforming T, and then I can find the Consham eigenvalues of this. Because it's just a small matrix, I can sometimes even diagonalize it by hand and find the those are the band eigenvectors. And sigma, if we look at it in this basis, which is the basis that we would use to interpret the photoemission experiment, is um, is uh, this sigma is k dependent? The, of course, I can look at it in real in a real space basis, and g i j to the minus one is going to be i omega plus mu minus plus t i j, which now is a matrix, and now the matrix will be diagonal. And what happens is that when I go from the orbital basis to the band basis, we introduce K dependence. So if we look at this matrix sigma K omega in the band basis, so J, J prime, where J is the index that I use for my bands, I have to convert from one basis to the other. So I will have sigma alpha beta, which was local, but now it becomes K dependent. Okay, so the notion of locality always refers to a basis set. A, this is a concrete example that you can see why. In here, we started with some tight binding basis. In that basis, things were K independent, but when we transformed to the band basis, it became K dependent. And it becomes even more um, so when we try to generalize this example to more complicated examples. For example, when we go to the Anderson lattice model, when my H of K becomes more complicated, when we have SPD electrons and F electrons here, and here we have the F block and the SPD block. So we have a matrix now that is very large. And now my matrix, my sigma will go here. That's my sigma matrix. But of course, when we go back to some other representation to get J of omega and K, what we need to do is we have to write the Hamiltonian and then we need to take this small block and embed it in the very big space and that introduces some k dependence so when we want to determine from an experiment how strong is the non-locality of how strong the k dependence is we need to first eliminate these form factors to extract the true self energy so that's basically what i wanted to say about the, the dynamic mean field theory. And uh, it's composed of really very, very simple operations. The first operation is an operation of projection where we go from the full Green's function to a local Green's function. And sometimes, when we have many, many electrons, the projection not only focuses on getting the local Green's function, but also the correlated block. So this projection, when I go from PG to G log of the F electrons is a projection that builds the locality 
but also takes the correlated block. That's the, the, the first idea, the idea of projection. Then there's the idea of embedding that once you get the self energy from the impurity model, we have to embed it in the Green's function. And that's what's drawn here. This is the embedding. And the embedding uh, can be something very simple. Like for example, when only the F electrons are correlated, we just need to draw a big matrix and put the sigma in that block. That's an example of embedding. Uh, but it can be more complicated. We may want to go back to the full Laplacian plus Beacon Sham and embed the self energy of the impurity in the full Hilbert space of all the electrons, including the core electrons and the very high energy electrons. But it's always the same concept of embedding. We, we, when we go from the lattice to the atom, we project. When we go from the atom to the lattice, we embed. So those are the two things. We go from the atom to the lattice and we embed. When we go from the solid, probably solid is a better word than lattice. So when we go from the atom to the solid, we embed. That's E. And when we go from the solid to the atom, we project. And P, uh, the atomic, let's say atomic shell, the correlate atomic shell. So that's basically the two key ideas. And those are the things that are used in the self consistent in the DMFT self consistency condition. We start with from a solid, we do a projection, we get an impurity model, and then we embed it back in the solid, and we request that this is self consistent. In the process, there's a, another thing which is an important concept, which is solving, which is solve the impurity model. So we have the impurity model here. The impurity model gets a bath that I call delta or G0 minus one, and that delivers the impurity, sigma of impurity. So this is called the solver and solve. So we saw, so there are three important ideas, solver, embedding, and projection. And if you have these three ideas clear in your head, you can write dynamic mean field theory for any system in question, because all you need to do is uh, write what we call a DMFT loop. So what is a DMFT loop? A DMFT loop, so let me add one more slide here. The DMFT loop starts with some environment, put it in the solver, the solver solves and it gives you an impurity model. And with Corey, you will practice doing that. How you put a G0, you put in the solver, you get the impurity model. Now the impurity model is an atomic quantity. So now we need to reinsert it in the lattice. So we need to embed, we need to put it back in the in the Green's function of the lattice. And for a realistic system, it's sort of complicated because H of K is fairly big, depending what you keep in your valence, you can have, uh, I don't know, 20, 30 bands. So these are big matrices or more. Uh, we can do up to 200 bands. And then we need to put this sigma impurity in this thing. And then there's one more subtlety that there's something which we need to subtract, which is the correlation that was already present in, in the exchange correlation potential. And Sankuk Choi will hopefully discuss that. Once we embed it, 
the Green's function. Now we project. So we project. When we project, we get the local Green's function of a small block. So now we have a five by five or 10 or 14 by 14 Green's function. Now, now that's a very small matrix and there's no K dependence anymore. And now we need to construct the next G zero minus one. And that's given by the DMFT self consistency condition. So we just simply go around, iterate this loop until it converges. And now you know everything you need to know about dynamic amine mean field theory. So basically, this is probably a good place uh, to um, stop and see if there are questions. So I stop sharing here and I will go to the screen, the first screen and write what I hope I explained to you. So now you know about the MFT, you know about impurity self energies, you know about quantum embedding, you know about vice field, you know why you need Vanier functions or local orbitals to make sense of all this. And you know even better about correlations. And I guess you also know about the DMFT loop. Questions? No questions? I'm not seeing any right now, but let's okay. wait a sec, maybe. Okay, I can wait for uh, a minute. And if not, we can move on to the next step. The next step is that we're gonna look at how we combine the, the, the two things that we learned. We learned first about the FT here. We learned about weakly correlated systems. We learned about electronic structure. We learned about, uh, let's see, what, 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 what were you supposed to learn in the first part? Uh, um, the targets were these things. And in the second part, the targets here were this. And I'm headed towards showing you that now to achieve our research goals, we want to combine these two things that we learned. And I'll show you one example, which is the LDA plus TMFT loop. And then that, let's see how I'm doing with time. I can probably do this nicely in probably 20 minutes. And then I will have a little bit of time to pick one example of some correlated materials to show you that this was this is a good thing to learn so that you have more inspiration for the rest of the lectures and again even if not everything is clear now you will see that hopefully in a lot more formal detail by the other lecturers. So Gabby, there are two questions now. Okay. So there's a question, what's the performance of DMFT for correlations and transition metals as compared to DFT plus U or DFT plus U plus V? Okay, okay, okay. So 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 that's that, that's very good. So that, that that's a very good question. And the 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 answer is simple in this case, because we have all the tools to answer that. So so 
so the Green's function in DFT is given by, sorry. But, okay, first, let me answer what is DFT plus U. Now, DFT plus U is DMFT if one uses Hartree-Fock as the solver. So if we take this sigma impurity and we replace it by the Hartree-Fock value, U, A, B, C, D, uh, and A, D, minus U, A, B, C, D, I think I'm getting the hope I'm hoping I'm getting the indices right. So C C C C. If you if you do have to focus on this interaction and you replace it here, you get LDA plus U. Now the important thing is that this is a static quantity. So what you miss when you do LDA plus U is all the interesting frequency dependence that is hidden in sigma of omega which manifests itself in satellites, in structure in the spectra, in non-trivial things in the spectra. For example, that the masses of the quasiparticles are different than the masses of LDA. So in the example of the iron nictites that I will show, you, you can see that there's renormalizations of the order three, and in nickel, in iron, which is the thing you were interested in, which are the transition metal oxide, there are also very large um, mass renormalizations. So all that is missed in DFT, is missed in DFT plus U. It requires something which genuinely contains the frequency dependence of the self energy. What is the, so what is missed is frequency dependence. And of course, temperature dependence. What was the other question? Well, there's, there's so will DMFT work well for antiferromagnetic or ferromagnetic materials? Yes, it's been used extensively uh, for iron, nickel, cobalt, all these things have been studied with LDA plus DMFT. And the satellites show up and the effective masses come in. So it is, if you're interested in those problems, I think it's a good method to use. And I can provide references as well later. And then there's a, now a third question. Um, it's been uh, it's been brought up that depending on the type of projection method used, Vonier versus projectors, you will get different results from your, your DFT plus DMFT calculation. Sure. The question is: Is there any way around? Is there any way around this issue? Sure. Sure. Yes. Okay. So uh, okay. So maybe I should show uh, um, I should show. The, 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 the last slide so that people remain in the school. So let me stop share this and now share the screen. Okay, so I think I can already show you the, the punchline of the, of, of, of the school which is certain view of how we can now tackle the, the, the many body problem. And what, because I already explained enough concepts to understand this diagram. Uh, and there are basically two approaches to 
the exact solution of the many body problem. One is sort of based on wave functions and one is based on Green's functions. And this figure is from a review article that I wrote with Paul Kent, which leads another DOE center, which is focusing on improving wave functions. This summarizes the knobs that you have in Green's function method. So the so there, there are two parts to this question, three parts. So first, let me give you the bird eye view and then I will address the question in detail. So this axis is what I call the heading axis because Hedin invented the, the, the first principles method, the GW method. And it starts here with the Consham Green's function. And then the Consham Green's function, of course, depend on lots of things, depends on the exchange correlation potential you have. If you take GGA or you take LDA, you will get different Green's functions. So this is a little bit the type of ambiguity that you are alluding to. And then of course, we can move in a Green's function method to the GW method, which I already described or we can do the first ver ver vertex correction. So there is sort of this axis, which is like a Jacob's ladder where we are sort of moving to, to paraphrase uh, a, a term that was used in the density functional context for the different types of exchange correlation potential by Purdue. So this is sort of the stair to heaven, the Jacob's ladder, where you start with the DFT Green's function, depends on lots of things. And then as you advance, you get better methods, more accurate. So that if you do perturbation theory, the, the, the problem why this is not a final story is because in the correlated materials, this series just doesn't converge. So the first orders have very little to do with the reality. If you have a mod insulator, you can do perturbation theory at infinite order and you still don't get the mod insulator. So then we have this other axis, which is what I call the DMFT axis. So here, what we will do is not attempt to do perturbation theory, but we stick to single side DMFT, but go directly to infinite order. And here is the problem that you raised uh, that we have some parameters. We have the U we, and we have the projector. And of course, the two of them are tied. So the problem is not as bad as you say it is in the sense that if you use different projectors and you also use different U's, you, I think are still okay. But of course you have the use and the projectors, but then when you go to cluster DMFT, the sensitivity to the projectors will be a lot less. Uh, and once you go beyond the DFT, this level will be DFT plus DMFT because you're using the Consham Hamiltonian. What you will learn in school is that you can actually combine DMFT with GW, and hopefully you will get a demonstration of how to do that. And then the, 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 these problems disappear. So there is a chart on how we do better and we understand the problems, but how that happens in reality, not in a cartoon that one writes for science, you will have to sit through the lecture of some Choi and see how things work. So there are two levels answer to your question. One, I believe that if you change the projector and you change the U, you still will get a compatible results. And second, as you sort of improve the level of approximation, then things get better. Are there any other question? I think there was somebody wanted a clarification on what the solver in the DMFT loop is doing. Yeah. Okay. So for that, I guess I have to go to Blackboard. 
yeah there was yeah okay yep so okay so so we have an impurity model the, the, the impurity model has a medium the medium is characterized by a function g0 i omega it's i omega plus mu in the Haber model delta by omega you can ask what's the meaning of this function this is something that measures the metallicity that measures how how the electron can escape from from the bath if you remember uh when i drew the impurity model i drew an electron here that was hybridizing with the bath so the hybridization delta is d square i omega n minus ek sum over k so that's the impurity solver receives information for how the bath is if delta is huge the electron likes to move around it's very itinerant if delta is small the electron is stuck so you have a function and 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 as i explain how localized or itinerant things are may depend on frequency some frequency may be localized and delta is small and another frequency might be large so you have this this hybridization function and from the hybridization function you have to extract the self-energy and for that, you need to solve a quantum mechanical problem. That's the job of the solver. And you will see explicitly in Corey Melnick's uh, lecture, how the solver actually works. Are there any other questions? There was a question. Yes, there was one other question. Uh, there was a question about what are the satellites? You spoke about the satellite. The yes, people, satellites. People, okay, okay. So people like to measure ARPES. I mean, where you have the, you make color plots. Here we have K. Here you have energy. You, this is a photomission effect. What got Einstein the Nobel Prize. You, you eject electrons and see what energy they had in the solid and what frequency they have. And normally, if you have bands, you will see something like that. So that's a band. And you, you see well-defined bands. But sometimes you have many other features. You have things which are non-dispersive, but they are clearly visible. And these things are called satellites. So those are features in A of omega and K, which is the imaginary part of the Green's function. Those are features in the photoemission spectra, which are not bands. The bands, we know what they are. We, but the satellites is something else. Uh, sometimes the bands are not the DFT bands. Sometimes the bands have kinks. Sometimes you have something that crosses the Fermi level and then does this. This is omega. And K. So there are many, many features in photoemission. If you if you want to do photoemission spectra, you will not get anything useful from just LDA plus U. LDA plus U can be okay for energies, for binding energies or for cohesive energies, but it cannot give access to the spectra. Other questions? No, that was the last one, Gabby. Okay, very good. So then uh, let me go and uh, explain how do we combine these methods? Because that's relatively easy. And again, probably I should do, am I in the blackboard right now? You see my board or you see the, yeah, you see the board, right? Yeah, we see the board. Okay, very good. So then let me sort of remind you now what we learned. So we learned about the FT. We, know, we learned that the basic variable is the density. We learned that from the density, you need to get uh, some exchange correlation potential, which is a functional of R, and you can use LDA, GGA, whatever you like. Then you have to put that, if you want, in some Green's function. Uh, uh, 
which has the, the heart rate, the change correlation potential. And then that's the consham dense function to the minus one. And then from the consham dense function or from the consham eigenstates, you go back and you recompute the density and you iterate until you fire, you have the final energy, the, the final density of the solid, and then you can evaluate things. So that's called DFT loop. Uh, I also taught you that there's something which is called DMFT loop. DMFT loop was something where we uh, started with the lattice greens function. And the lattice greens function was similar, was the consham greens function. But it had inside an embedded impurity self energy. We had that. And then we had to project to just get the local correlated greens function, for example, the F. And then we had to, after we projected, we have to build a G0, which is the vice field, G0 log minus one plus sigma impurity. And we have to put it inside the solver. And the solver will spit an impurity self energy until this converges. Now, we have sort of two worlds. This is the DFT world where all the correlations are treated using, all, all the correlations are treated or are represented by means of an exchange correlation potential. And then we have a DMFT world where all everything is represented by uh, an impurity self energy, which is embedded in the solid. So how do we combine these two worlds? Well, we combine these two worlds by simply merging here, these two things. In other words, there's, we can simply, this is one thing we need to do. So this, we need to merge or combine these two codes. And then we need to take into account really that uh, the exchange correlation has some of the correlation energy. So adding, any self energy, we need to subtract something static, which is the part of the correlation that was in the exchange correlation potential. And that's why I introduced you already to that idea of removing this double counting when I showed you how we go from LDA to GW. So when we went from LDA to GW, we didn't just add the self energy to the consham potential, but we took out the exchange correlation part and we added the self energy. But those are the only two things that you need to do. So we need to put here something static, which is called the double counting. And then we have to remove this and replace it by the lattice means function here. So we have these two loops now. So let me draw it nicely. These lines have to point here. So now we have two loops which are combined because we can constantly up upgrade the, con the exchange collision potential because we can get an improved density from the lattice. 
and we can constantly upgrade the lattice self energy because we can improve our impurity self energy uh, in each iteration. So that's basically what's called LDA plus DMFT. And now I can go back to uh, um, the slides. So, Gabby? Yes. There's a new question. OK. If we only use the LDA to solve the Hubbard model, how does the cone shams Green's functions look, look like? How much is it off from DMFT? They're, they're, they're static. Again, I mean, the, the Hubbard model, the, the, the Green's function of the Hubbard model, let me describe. Let me describe the density of states of the Hubbard model. So in a sketchy way, this is for you much less than T in G log. This is for you much bigger than T in G log. This is when U is less than T when we have a metal insulator transition. So in all the static methods, the only thing that you can get is this. If your self energy is a number, no matter what you put in here, if this is a constant, it's frequency independent, the only thing you can capture is this. You cannot capture, these things are called hover bands. I call them satellites, things which are not in the band theory, which are present in all these systems. And uh, okay, so I think it's time to actually go to uh, back to the slides. Okay, so so do you see now the slides? Yes, Gabby. Okay. All right. So that's what I derived this DFT loop and this DMFT loop. And uh, uh, this is the modern form of the DFT plus DMFT things. And now there are basically many, many codes which have this DFT plus DMFT implemented. I would say almost all the electronic structure codes now have some form of DMFT in them because this has been highly successful. So the, the thing that we are going to try to do in this school is to go a, a little bit beyond that by combining these things with GW. And the goal really is to try to improve the accuracy, reduce the number of parameters, and be, try to get something which is controlled where we can start getting estimates for when we're doing things which are not correct. And this is, of course, way work in progress. And this is sort of frontier of research. But that's sort of the, the thing we would like to do. And I would like sort of to give you now <clears throat> some uh, examples in the last 15 minutes of different types of correlated physics just to answer some of the questions by by showing you all these things that correlated materials do and why they are not described by simply LDA plus U or DFT. And okay, and I have just to motivate what's going to be in the school later, I wanted to start with semiconductors. And here, this is something I would like to highlight what Andre is going to show in his talk. Uh, here, what 
you see are the gaps of all semiconductors. And now uh, on this scale, the errors of the G0, W0, uh, or, or the subconsistent GW are big. But then you will see in Andre's, call, in Andre's talk how he gets closer to the results by improving the quality of the many body approximation and see how answers improved as you work harder. And that uh, will sort of illustrate also here, there's something very important about the physics here. What, what one is measuring here is really the experiment with some electron phonon contribution to the gap subtracted. And that's somehow tricky. And there's quite a bit of physics in how you take that. The electron phonon interaction does make some important contribution to the gaps in semiconductors. But I would say that in terms of basic science, the problem here is relatively under control because one has some feeling that the perturbation theory is converging, that when you do uh, first order and second order, your answers get closer, so, so one is happy. And I would like to contrast that with something that the center has been studying, which is something like iron antimony two, which is a strongly correlated semiconductor. Why is a semiconductor? Well, because this is the optical conductivity and it turns out that the optical conductivity at low temperatures, these are the lines in red, uh, go to zero. So this is, this is actually a narrow gap insulator. And the reason why we're interested in it is because of its thermal power. If we look at, not only, but that's, that's something which is very anomalous. If you look at the thermal power, here you read 40 and 50, and you think, well, okay, 50 is not a very big number. But when you look at the units, you see here, this, this is not microvolts, which is the usual unit for thermoelectricity, but millivolts. So this is about a thousand times bigger than most things that, that have been studied. So the origin of this is a big mystery. And this material goes from metal to insulator as a function of temperature. And when it does that, if we integrate the optical conductivity, we see that the optical conductivity is temperature, the spectral weight is temperature dependent up to something like 10 to the three or 10 to the four um, uh, centimeters inverse, which is a huge scale. Normally when, it, when, when the gap closes as a hundred Kelvin, the, the gap is also of the, of the order of, of, of a hundred Kelvin. So here the redistribution of spectral weight is over a much larger scale. And finally, if you look at the susceptibility, which is drawn here, you see that this has some minima around 150 Kelvin. So this goes from being a Pauli metal to being a semiconductor. And also the specific heat is sort of strange. So it has all the signatures of strong correlations. And one of the things that the center set up to do is to um, try to investigate a material of this kind and answer what is the electronic structure. And this is the, uh, what happens if you do LDA with the Becker potential, which is a little bit like LDA plus U. You, you find a gap which is too large. If you do LDA, the gap is zero. Uh, if you do GW, it still doesn't work and the gap is very large. The, the gap here is experimentally of the order of 0.1, a little bit less than 0.1 EV, um, uh, about 70 millikelvin. But once we use the more advanced methodologies that combine GW with the NFT, we get closer to the observed gap 
but more important, we were able to predict the photoemission spectra. And now you sort of see uh, that photoemission spectra uh, has a lot of features which are not precisely these band dispersions. So we can compare the results of theory and experiment directly. So that's basically one example of a material which is strongly correlated. And then I wanted to show you at least another thing which I think is very interesting, which is sort of Hoon's metals to wrap up this talk. And because this is again something that uh, is very active and motivates why you may want to sit in a school like this and run codes and things like that. Uh, this is sort of the basic physics of things. Uh, there's something which is called U, which penalizes charge fluctuations. So when U is very large, basically your N, uh, actually probably would be better to write here, N minus N zero, the, the, the charge stays fixed at some nominal valence. Now the Hund's coupling tried to align the spins of the atom. So what U does, it says that when you have configurations with different charges, it costs you a lot of energy to fluctuate between them. The J, what it says is that the configurations of the atom that are favorable are the ones which have parallel spins and different orbitals. You can think of it as being in a bus and thinking of the different rows at different orbitals. So people don't like to sit in the same row. So they, they like to occupy all the different orbitals, but they don't like to be in the same orbital. So J is concerned with orbital physics. U is concerned with charge fluctuation physics. And then with that background, I'll say a few words briefly about iron nictides, which is again, a fascinating material because these materials are A, they're topological, B, they're strongly correlated, C, they're high temperature superconductors. And if you do the DFT, they basically have bands with electrons and hole pockets. If you look at them in real space, they are layers of iron surrounded by nictides. So that's the material. And one very interesting thing that we learned from it from the first principle calculations is that these um, materials have correlations which are mostly controlled by the Hund's rule coupling and not by U. So that's sort of the advantage well, of models. I told you that you have ab initio and you have models and ab initio strives to have less parameters. The goal of the ab initio is to try to predict. The goal of the model is to try to understand and they all work together. So they, they, there is a really a synergistic interplay between these two things. And once one tried to model these iron nictides, it was discovered because people had not thought about that, that it's the Hund's rule coupling, for example, that controls the resistivity. Even with a very large J, the resistivity is zero. This will be this line when the Hund's coupling is zero. So there is a physical value for the Hund's coupling, which depends, of course, on the projector. And for that calculation, the approximately correct value is the, the, the green curve. And with those projectors, of course, one gets the correct answers, but you can vary the J and you see what effect it has and you can learn about the physics. So that's why this is a very important slide. And what was predicted is that as a function of temperature, you have a Fermi liquid regime at low temperatures and a very resistive regime at high temperatures, which is something that is seen in experiments. So this is potassium iron 2 arsenic 2. And at low temperatures, you have T square resistivity. The resistivity of this material is better than copper. So you have less than one ohm, one micro ohm centimeter. But if you look at high temperatures, the resistivity is like 500 micro ohm centimeters, which is five times 
the mod limit. The mod limit would be here. So these things are not well described by the standard theory of solids and it's the results of the physics of J. And I will so show one more slide because that has to do with the quantitative part that just like I showed you that with GW one is able to scan all the semiconductors and understand the trends in this case how the gaps of the semiconductors vary uh, among different semiconductors so if you want a semiconductor with some gap you can do a GW calculation and have an idea of the gap you will not get the exact number but you get all the trends and that's why uh, G0, W0 became such a method of choice. What we do here is we take all the iron nictides, and of course, as was pointed out in, in, in the talk, there are issues with what you take for projector and what you take for U, but here we take for U and projector the same for all the families, and we were able to predict all the trends in the effective masses for all the orbitals of all the iron nictides and in particular discover something very interesting which is called orbital differentiation that this xy orbital uh, when we get to the selenium and the tellurium end they get very very correlated so you saw models now you see the power of ab initio and what I wanted to, and, and also one can show that the fluctuating moment is essentially independent of material, but the type of magnetic order depends on the material. And this is something that you can do with LDA plus DMFT, but you cannot do with LDA plus U, and you cannot do with LDA. So there is really a huge room for applying these methods. And then let me skip this. There, there, there are, of course, hundreds and hundreds of papers uh, on applying electronic structure for TMFT to our nictides, but I would like to highlight one interesting aspect because I want you to connect you back to experiments and photoemission. I told you that this XY orbital was very correlated, and this is theoretical spectra. It's really invisible at at room temperature. The, the, we put a circle where it would have been, but there is no crossing in there. On the other hand, when you go to very low temperatures, you can see that there's a band here that cross. You see the band here. So this band completely disappears when you go to high temperatures. And this is something that has been seen in all the uh, iron nictides. And this is, for example, experiments at high temperatures, there's no crossing. And then as you start lowering the temperature, eventually at very low temperatures, you have a crossing of this XY band. And that, that has been seen uh, in, in, in many, many, many experiments. So I think I used pretty much all my time. So what I would like to do uh, is, is maybe wrap things up just to see what we learned so i will skip uh, many examples and it's not something that you miss because you're going to see i think nickel oxide which is um not insulator in 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 some of the practice sessions and i think you see aroselenide which is a huns metal in some other practice session. So it's not that uh, you miss much. I thought it was more important to cover things somehow in, in more detail than usually done. And then let's just simply review some of the topics that we covered. So let me just go back to my screen, uh, which I want to share. So basically uh, we did uh, this example with the DMFT loop uh, and we looked 
at some correlated semiconductors, and we introduced the notion of Hund's metal. So that's what we accomplished. And I'm uh, looking forward to an exciting school. We will see more on how to actually do these things by yourself from the various speakers. And again, the things are a little bit more heavy. It's not like a DFT school where you can run things in seconds and get the results. But I think that the results are rewarding and hopefully the practice sessions will be successful. Now, in terms of methodology, if we want to think a little bit further ahead, as I said, the tools are in relatively primitive stage, but I regard this as an advantage because that's those are the research opportunities. And uh, there might not be so easy to use, but I think we can make progress on how to make them user friendly and comments are of course most welcome and should send them in the Slack. And the most important thing from the point of view of students is there a huge number of things that you can do with them because there are many, many, many correlated materials. So there's some investment uh, to some steep slope in learning how to do these things, but there's also some big reward because one can study many, many, many different compounds that have not been investigated before. I try to highlight the MFT as conceptual and technical, allows you to think about the physics of correlations and in fact has allowed to solve many deep puzzles. I mentioned Hun's metals, but there are many more that came out from doing this type of calculation, playing with codes and running things in materials. And then you come up with very interesting ideas because you can ask, where is the physics coming from? How, why am I observing this? What, what element in the Hamiltonian is responsible for that physics that I observe. And there are many quantitative issues that have not been studied. And as the methods get more and more precise, we'll be able to investigate them. And I think the ultimate challenge is really the, the, the using these methods close to experimental groups to really find better materials and to understand the experiments. And that's why our center is called Center for Theoretical Spectroscopy in Material Design. And I um, wish you a good school, and I hope that you all will be able to contribute to this very challenging area. And thank you for your attention. I think I overextended my stay by four minutes, but I finished more or less in time. Thank you. Thank you, Gabby. There were a few questions. Would you? You want to enter? Yeah, yeah, sure. If people want to stay, I can stay. So here's a question that will be close to your heart. Can spin fluctuations in hemi fermions be addressed by this approach? Yeah, I think there are two types. Okay, so there are two things. First of all, if you look at the heavy fermions, you see that down to fairly low temperatures, you have local moments so that the spin fluctuations can immediately be gotten from the spin susceptibility. But uh, at lower temperatures, one can also generalize these methods and compute spin susceptibilities. In fact, Hyowan Park, who was a student at Rutgers and developed a method how to compute chi of Q and omega with LDFSDMFT, has an article in Science where he computed the spin fluctuation of uh, spectra measured by neutron in some canonical heavy fermion system. So if I had time, I would have maybe also covered the physics of heavy fermions and show the spin fluctuations. But the answer is yes, and has been done. And if you want to find the article, uh, we can just Google Hyowan Park and heavy fermions and maybe John Lawrence was also an article uh, in that article, but the answer is yes. One can do that and it has been very successful and it's been done in the past three years. So another question is, can you use 
DMFT to study lattice dynamics, particularly to compute the phonon spectra. Yes. When the system yes. is at a finite temperature. Okay. Uh, yes. Um, uh, in principle, yes. With your with our code, no. That's because we still have not implemented uh, the forces with the um, with the with these methods. And in fact, actually, I, I should probably explain a little bit more what was the original plan of the center in this respect, uh, because it's sort of interesting, because it brings me to some, um, to, to, uh, to, to, to something I should have probably done and I didn't do again because of lack of time. So let me share my screen again to answer that question. So share the screen. Uh, so originally, okay, so our center has one more um, hammer in the toolbox, which you will hear from Nicola Narata and Yongxin Yao, which is what's called the Gatzwiller Rotational Rotation Invariant Slave Boson Approach, which is something that was started by Frank Lesherman, Kai Ming Ho, Yong Yao, Nicola Lanata, which is like dynamic mean field theory with a very, very simple bath, which has one side where the computations of the total energies, which we do have, are essentially at speeds which are comparable to the speeds of the LDA. So our idea was to extend that to do phonons, uh, to have a fast method to be able to do forces and phonons um, with this two side DMFT. But this is not implemented, but it is in the plans of the center. And I'm really hoping you'll see a lot of progress has been made. Uh, and I'm hoping that uh, in the next year or so, we'll be able to go back to this project. So, uh, are there other questions? There's, like a four more. there's okay. a question about multi ferroic materials and using the using DMFT for that DFT plus DMFT. Yeah. So, yes, I mean, I, I think that in principle, um, uh, this is a very interesting area, but one would like to, if we want to go in there, what we would like, what one should do. This is a research project to be pursued. We should implement the Vanderbilt King Smith Resta formula in this context of LDA plus DMFT, because then we will, in multiferroics, what one wants is to get not just the magnetism, which one can easily get, but also the electric polarization, right? So for that, we need to compute the polar polarization of the solid. And then uh, in principle, it can be done. The Vanderbilt Kinsmith uh, Resta formula has been generalized to uh, correlated materials. And in principle, there is a DMFT formula that uh, one could implement. So that's a very nice uh, research opportunity, but it's not implemented, but it, it's not hard to do. So in principle, yes, one would have to implement that. If somebody is interested in that, they should write to me and I can give them the reference of what needs to be done, but it's not just push the button. One would need to do a little bit of work before one gets with uh, LDA plus DMFT, the the um, polarization, the ferroelectric polarization of the solid. 
But then it will be interesting because you can get both the magnetism and the correlation right and the thermal electricity. So the answer is yes and no. In principle, it can be done. In practice, it's not just you push the button because it has not been implemented. But I know how to do it and I can tell you which paper you can get the equations. Thank you, Gabby. There, there's a question about DFT plus DMFT for magnetic systems. I think. Mm -hmm. and, and in particular, can you, can you use this to extract the, the effect of J in a metallic system? Yeah, I mean, the, the question of how of, of the determination of J and determination of parameters does deserve a talk in itself. And this, um, and, and this approach and the approaches that we have are really well tailored to do that. But it's not a simple question to answer in just uh, 30 seconds, because you will see in the talk by Sang Choi how he determines the J's with, within this constrained RPA uh, subconsistent GW approach. So some tools for determining the J are there, but I, I would say this is something that uh, remains uh, something that should be investigated more and it would be nice, maybe in the next school we can have a lecture just devoted on how how to extract model parameters from this type of calculation and in the meanwhile let me just simply share my screen to finish answer the first question there was the question whether one can compute coherent ex the, the 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 spin excitations in heavy fermions this is the paper I was alluding to. So here you have the reference in science. Um, this is Hyogwan Park. And this, uh, and they fit the, 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 um, the neutron scattering experiment extremely well. So, so this is really a nice, it's, it's a nice, exciting uh, uh, thing that one can do. Okay. Other questions? No, I don't see any, Gabby. Okay, good. So then we only exceeded our allotted time by 15 minutes. So that's very good. We stayed on time. So I wish you a very happy school and thanks for coming to did my Did you get the last oh. dynamics question? What? Yes. Yeah, you did. Okay, sorry. And, and there's and, one more. And I'll be happy if people still have more questions they can write to me and I'll be happy to entertain them. And otherwise there's this Slack environment that Vincent is promoting that I think is a very good way to communicate and create community. Okay. Okay, thank you, Gabby. Oh, sure, bye-bye. So everyone, the this Zoom session will end, and there's a new Zoom link which you should have for the the lecture at 1 p.m. with Andre Kudupov. So I hope to see you in about 45 minutes. Okay. Bye bye.